Um, okay, so my talk for today is entitled A Revolutionary History, Latin American Migrations to the United States. And um, we've been taught, history professors have been taught to stick like sexy words into titles because of courses and of talks because that gets people in, in the door. So I put revolution in there, but I want to talk about revolution in a, in a kind of expansive way. So I'll get into that. Um, and I want to make today the probably really not very controversial argument that it's really important these days to understand this particular history, the history of Latin American immigration to the US. Because since at least 1848, so a fairly long time ago, um, political, economic, and social revolutions have helped fuel Latin American migrations to the US. Um, and these migrations have in turn revolutionized uh, the demographics and the politics of the US. So I'll talk about all of that. Um, today, I'm gonna start with a brief discussion of some useful, useful concepts for discussing immigration history. Um, and then I wanna zoom in on three case studies describing how the history of describing the history of immigration from Mexico, from Cuba, and from Central America, and focusing on how events that happened there shaped immigration here. So I'll spend a little bit more time on Mexican immigration since it's the most important sending country with the largest number of immigrants. Um, but I'll talk also about Cuban migration, which has had an outsized effect on US politics. Have, are there any Floridians in the room? Okay, so you know that already. Um, and then Central American migration, which is so much in the news today, but also has a relatively long history. Um, and then I'll just at the end kind of wrap up by talking about how migration from Latin America has revolutionized the United States um, through our economy and our labor market, through demographic change, and through, poli through political upheaval, um, which we're ex experiencing today, but this is not the first time. Um, and then through the politics and political leanings of migrants themselves. Um, okay, so couple of useful concepts for immigration history. Um, it's tricky to study immigration history, um, especially for historians. The way we're trained um, is to really go deep into the archives of a particular country, usually, or a particular region. And that often ex means that we learn one language um, and we base ourselves for our research in one country. Um, but migration doesn't lend itself all that well to that kind of research, because you really need to be doing work in both the sending country and the receiving country. Um, it's a challenge, but more and more historians are starting to recognize that and realize that they need to be kind of training themselves to work in more than one country. So I did that for my work and more and more people are doing that and have been doing that. Outside of academia, um, we tend to really only, like in up through high school, in public education at least, we tend to really only learn US history. Um, my, his, my US history colleagues would complain that we don't learn that all that well either. But um, we rarely learn the history of the biggest migrant sending regions to the US. Um, we rarely learn the history of Latin America. Um, I don't know if, did anyone in the room have a course on Latin America or study Latin America before getting to college? Good. In social studies, yeah. Um, yeah, and I mean, I, I know now from teaching for eight years, like what my students know. Um, and they know moments, they know 1492, they know remember the main, right? And they, re and they know uh, maybe like Fidel Castro and maybe Hugo Chavez, right? But we don't really have a great understanding of the history of Latin America or the factors that lead to migration. Um, and so we can't really understand the complexity of the root causes of migration. Um, and so why does this matter? Because I think it keeps us from developing good immigration policy. Um, it's all that right now, and I'll talk about this, our policy is all directed at the border, at controlling and deterring immigrants, um, but there's a real lack of understanding of what in other countries may be driving immigration. Um, for another thing, um, US involvement in those regions has been um, pretty consistent throughout the 20th century and has at times contributed to migration. I'll talk about that too a little bit later. And so understanding that requires us to kind of look at US policy a little bit differently and also to consider how our foreign policy is related to our immigration policy. And sometimes foreign policy actually is immigration policy. So this is my argument for, the, for, for why we should study the history of other regions and their migration and US uh, involvement there. Um, 
Okay, so to the word in the title, again, revolutions, I am gonna briefly talk about Pancho Villa and Fidel Castro and the Sandinistas, but just really briefly, because like I said, I wanna talk about revolutions more broadly. And it's, I found very helpful um, uh, a book called Cousins and Strangers, Spanish Immigrants in Buenos Aires, 1850 to 1930, Jose, by Jose Moya. It's actually the first book I read as a PhD student. Um, and this was a scholar who spent, spent like, I don't know, 10 years doing the research for this book, almost didn't get tenure, then produced this amazing book, and uh, did his research equally in Argentina and in Spain. And he was talking about an earlier period that I'm gonna be talking about today, but in the beginning of the book, which I really re recommend you reading, it's very readable and good, he talks about the five global revolutions that led to the mass European migration that happened between um, you know, let's say about 1850 to 1930, the time bracket in this book. Um, so he talks about the demographic revolution. So that's the demographic transition. Um, you've probably heard about that, but that's the transition of, um, it has, it's sort of two things, like birth rate and infant mortality. So w when infant mortality is high, birth rate is high, right? And then inf infant mortality declines thanks to achievements in medication, medicine and, and health. Um, but it takes a little while for the birth rate to, the birth rate declines as well, but it takes a little bit, a little while. So there's a middle period always in this demographic transition where the birth rate is really high and the infant mortality rate is really low and populations expand, um, really sometimes exponentially. So that happened in Europe in the 19th century and it happened in Latin America um, in the 20th. Um, the liberal revolution. So that's the idea of the transition from monarchical governments that tended to restrict their populations, that tended to restrict who could come in and who could leave their country, to liberal governments that place an emphasis on freedom of movement. And as we'll see, you know, <laughs> this is often still pretty complicated, right? And um, governments tend to want to Governments, pol politicians, and polities tend to want to be involved in who comes in, who comes in and out of their borders. Um, but still, he argues this liberal re revolution created a regime of free movement of peoples, freer movement of peoples. Um, the agricultural revolution. So, in short, the con consolidation of small land holdings into larger land holdings, um, more efficient production of food, which feeds more people, but also pushes people off of farmlands. Um, and leads to the migration of small farmers. Um, the Industrial Revolution, you all know what that is. Um, how does it relate to migration? It leads to urbanization. Um, it creates jobs in cities, not only in people's home country, but then also in um, faraway countries. So, so there's a kind of a stage migration whereby people migrate out of farms and villages to um, cities in their home country, and then they're sort of primed to migrate to industrial jobs in other places. And then finally, and really importantly, the transportation revolution. So he is talking about the steam engine, right? And the, and the development of new modes of transportation that are faster and cheaper. New ways for people to get, in this case, across the Atlantic Ocean. But when we come to the 20th century, we're still talking about railroads because the railroads are being developed all over the Americas into the 20th century, and then we're talking about airplanes. So all throughout the 20th century, still it continues to get cheaper and easier and faster for more and more accessible for people to migrate. Um, interestingly, Moya doesn't actually mention revolutions as in revolutionary wars, right? Or revolutions and wars, but these are important too. Um, and all of them, as I said, occur in Latin America at different times, um, and all of them are factors are in sending Latin American immigrants to the US. And then another useful concept I wanna mention is push factors and pull factors. And most of you have probably heard about this. Um, but just the idea that you, know, you want to, when you wanna figure out why a particular migration is happening, you always need to look at both sides. You need to look at who's, what are the factors that are pushing people out and what are the factors that are pulling people in. But what's interesting in Latin America, as I kind of said before and we'll come back to, is that sometimes the United States is actually helping to create the push factors. So sometimes when we intervene in Latin America, we're contributing to those push factors. So sometimes the push factors can actually come from the receiving country. Um, and then uh, finally, I just like this quote. Um, I'm currently reading a book by Jason DeParle called A Good Provider is the One Who Leaves. It's really good um, so far. I'm a third of the way through. But I saw, um, but he, he, in he's ta he talks about the history of migration from the Philippines to the United States, which actually has a lot in common with the history of Cuba and, and other parts of Latin America. 
Um, and he says migration is the ripple effect of history. So these historical events happen and we don't always know how they're going to lead to migration, but when we look backwards, we can see how they do, how they did. Um, okay, so, so just, you know, when we talk about push factors, um, economies are probably the, one of the most important um, push factors or pull factors, right? It's always gonna be the dynamic between, it always has been the dynamic, not always, but for the, for the 20th century and parts of the 19th has been the dynamic that the US economy has been much larger, wages have been much higher um, than in Latin America. And so that has drawn people, has pulled people from Latin America to the US. But there obviously are other factors as well. We can all, if we read the news, we can see what those are. Violence, political persecution, um, ease of transportation, as I said before, lack of access to land, natural disasters, climate change, um, and then even um, and this is something that comes up when you're a historian who does research into you know, actual immigrants and why they immigrate. Sometimes people just go for adventure. Sometimes people go because they want to. They're sick of life in their small town and they go. So we have to kind of take all of that um, into consideration. And so obviously these push factors uh, you know, overlap with more this idea of, of, the, of these five revolutions. And I'm gonna try to just point out the push factors and the revolutions as I go through these individual um, cases. Okay, so let's turn to a discussion of Mexican migration history. Um, today, Mexicans are the largest single group of immigrants in the United States. Um, and um, by a lot. <laughs> so uh, how did we get here? Um, the, I guess the important thing is that um, most Mexican migration has occurred since 1970. But Mexican migration has been going on since, this starts in 1850, but actually I'm gonna call it as, eight, I'm gonna call it 1848. What happened in 1848? Anyone? Yeah, and who said that? Who said that? Yes, Mexican-American War. Um, so uh, in case you don't remember this from school or from that absolute ad, no, this is a, a while ago. <laughs> there was an absolute ad, it said, it was this map and it said absolute Mexico. And, and we got so mad about it in the US that Absolute had to withdraw it. But anyway, um, so Me Mexico used to be twice the size it is now. And after the Mexican-American War, Mexico lost half of that territory um, to the US. Um, and uh, so actually there's a saying, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. And that alludes to the loss of that territory and the fact that the Mexican citizens who were living in Texas and California and Nuevo Mexico and Arizona um, overnight became US citizens, although it was complicated. Some of them lost their land, some of their status was murky. Um, and actually one of the first population movements was a movement of um, former Mexican citizens back into Mexico, back, back into what was the reduced territory of Mexico. Right, so there's, a, so there's a southern migration. But fairly quickly, um, a northern migration begins. Um, and uh, moving into the 1890s, there's a fairly small but consistent migration um, as both Mexico and the US were building their railroad system. So that is the transportation revolution that we're talking about. And what you can, what you can maybe see here, I know it's not that clear, but um, is that the US railroads are predominantly east-west and the Mexican railroads are predominantly north-south. Those are a re a really important three kind of northward branches. Um, and those railroads helped to set, help to establish the migration patterns that would hold um, really, I mean, I would argue into today of Mexicans from the center of Mexico. Um, you can see where the railroads are really dense here up into the border towns, especially El Paso. Um, so uh, Mexican laborers, are really important to building the railroads um, in Mexico and then into the US. One thing about working on a railroad is as you're working on building the railroad, you're also migrating. Um, so those railroads actually brought people into the US. Um, and then they also worked in, you know, as we have agricultural development, so back to the agricultural de uh, revolution, like irrigation in the Southwest, they're increasing jobs for Mexican migrants. Um, then we have the Mexican Revolution. So here we have a real revolution, right, with Pancho Villa, and Emiliano Zapata, and um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the, with the imagery from that time. Um, what it is is really an enormous civil war. Um, a million people are killed, and hundreds of thousands of people become refugees, and people ride the newly created, the newly built railroads up into Texas. Um, so this is kind of an interesting chapter of Mexican history, of immigration history, because it's Mexicans as political refugees. 
These were really people who were on the, some of them were, you know, just leaving because the war came to their town, but there was also a significant number of political refugees who came um, and settled in Texas. Um, I wrote my first book on uh, a war that happened right after the revolution, it was a kind of a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Side effect of the Mexican Revolution, the Cristero War. It was a war between church and state. And um, again, it produced a significant flow of, this time, religious refugees. Um, and that became a pattern. When there was a political problem in Mexico, people, people knew the way to the United States, and there were Mexican communities in the United States. Um, but also in the 1920s, um, there's also a, uh, a lot going on in the US economy. This is the Roaring Twenties, right? And um, industry is booming, agriculture is booming, and um, this also overlaps with World War I. So native-born laborers are sometimes being drafted to go to the war. There's a labor shortage. Um, and so we see a little spike, and I, I only break this out because it's so hard to see in the 100-year um, graph I showed you earlier, there's a spike in Mexican migration um, to the United States in the 1920s. Um, okay, you can see that it drops off very precipitously in 1930. What happens? Yeah. So the Great Depression comes. And this is something that's really important to mention about Mexican migration, is that it's been defined by these cycles of emigration and then deportation. Um, uh, various factors have driven Mexicans to come to the United States, our, and, we, and our economy has pulled Mexicans to the United States, but at various points we have decided that we don't want Mexicans to be in the United States. So after 1929 is one of these points, uh, Mexican immigrants become scapegoated for joblessness and budget short, shortfalls, and migrants are rounded up and deported um, all over the, all, all over the, not the United States, but sort of Midwest to West Coast. Um, it's known as a repatriation. Um, and the numbers, we don't really have great numbers from the time period, but it was at least a couple hundred thousand that were repatriated. Some people argue it was a million. Um, and, uh, and so this is just some sort of headlines and photos from then. The repatriation drives continued from 1929 to 1936. Um, and it's interesting because I, I wrote an article about this, um, why, you know, about deportation and why it's not such a great immigration policy. Because what happened in this round of deportation is that people came back. Um, people were, uh, first of all, a lot of the people who were here at that point had US citizen children. Um, so if they themselves didn't come back, their US citizen children did. Um, and uh, shortly after the 1930s, the US economy picks up again. Now we're at the 1940s in World War II. Again, native born Americans are being drafted into the war. There's a labor shortage. Um, the economy is, um, the economy is, is accelerating once again. Um, and so, uh, and so in 1942, immigration picks up and we actually develop um, a guest worker program. The, some of you may have read about this, the Bracero program, which runs from 1942 to 1964. It overlaps with you know, our economic needs, but also a period of development and growth in Mexico that's referred to as the Mexican miracle. So the Mexican economy actually really accelerates during this time. Um, and in large, in the cities in Mexico, there's a tremendous amount of growth and wealth, but um, that development doesn't extend to people in the countryside. And the, the demographic revolution plays a role here as well. After the 19, after the, really after the revolution, the population begins to recover. And in the 1940s through the 1960s, you really see the continuation of these very high birth rates. It's a Catholic country. Um, and uh, very in falling infant mortality rates and no war, right? So all of a sudden there's an enormous population, much of it young, right? And, the Mexi and this Mexican economy, which is dynamic and is growing and is creating wealth, can't employ all of um, the people that are, uh, all of the population. Um, again, back to that cycle. Um, so we have the Bracero program, which allows people to come in at the same time, there was always greater demand for both labor in the US and for employment in Mexico. And so along with the Bracero program, there's a parallel um, like undocumented migration that happens where people on both sides, US employers and also Mexicans sort of say, why should I bother with this onerous process of applying for a visa and waiting in line when I can just cross the border um, and, and get a job? One of the same kinds of questions that people ask today. Um, so uh, so then back to that cycle, 
we have in 1954 something called, and it really was, this really was the official name for it, Operation Wetback, which was a term um, really commonly used. Actually, it's still kind of commonly used in Spanish, um, but now it sounds offensive to us in English. Um, but, uh, but this was another, um, another deportation drive. Um, it, the US deported 100, 100, uh, maybe a couple hundred thousand people of Mexican heritage. Um, and the Bracero program ends, this is in 1954, and the Bracero program ends in 1964. And when the Bracero program ends, there is now no real legal mechanism for, the, the, there's very limited legal mechanisms for people to come in from Mexico. Because in 1965, we have, the, um, we have a enormous shift in our immigration laws. We go from a quota system where people are allowed in or not allowed in based on the nation where they're born to the system that we still have today where um, people are, are allowed in based on their skills and based, more importantly, on family reunification. Um, the quota system makes it easier for people from all, oh, a lot of other parts of the world to come in, right? Asian immigrants can now come in legally for the first time um, since uh, the early 1900s. People can come in from Eastern Europe, um, but it makes it harder for Mexicans and other Latin Americans because it puts a hemispheric cap of 120,000 people from the Western Hemisphere. Um, so, uh, so the competition for visas is, is very, um, increases. Um, and meanwhile, Mexico's population is still growing. Um, and so there's a huge pressure to migrate to the US. And then the demand for Mexican labor is still there, especially in the Southwest. Um, and then increasingly, as we get into the 60s and 70s and 80s and to today, not just in the agricultural sector, but also in the growing service sector and construction sector. Um, so, uh, so these push-pull factors that we've talked about have only intensified, and yet there's not really a legal path to migration for most Mexicans. Um, and so by the 1970s, the number of undocumented immigrants from Mexico has tripled. Um, and I wanna try and zoom through the rest of Mexico, but I'll just, I'll say that um, our efforts to deal with that legislatively have only, I, I won't say they've made it worse, I'll say they have done nothing to stop the problem, right? The problem of undocumented immigration. That in fact, I think I have a chart later on that I'll show you, but that in fact, you know, from 1990, let's say 1970 onward, um, almost all of our immigration legislation has been directed at controlling the border, deterring migrants, um, very, in, a, in a very lax sense at punishing employers who hire um, undocumented immigrants, although we don't really do that systematically. Um, and in all of that time, through legislation after legislation, the number of undocumented immigrants has risen, has, has just continued, has risen you know, pretty much continuously. Um, so, uh, and then there have been some side effects of that legislation, like as it got harder to cross the border, more and more undocumented immigrants decided to settle um, in, rather than crossing back and forth, which Mexicans had done for, mo for most of the century. They had come, many of them had come for, agri for agricultural work and then gone back to Mexico in the off season. But now with the cost of crossing so high and the danger increasing, they tended to settle um, in the United States. So then we start to see um, you know, an, inc an increased population of legal Mexican migrants, but also an increased population of undocumented Mexican migrants. And we start to see these sort of highly visible Mexican communities growing up in places like LA, San Diego, San Francisco, Chicago. Um, and and that, that's, really, that's sort of the roots of um, you know, sort of undocumented Mexican migration um, that, that, has, uh, that really continued until very recently. So um, yeah, just some of the legislation worth, worth mentioning. I mean, 1986, the Immigration and Reform and Control Act, um, that was under Reagan, and that's the, that's the Republican amnesty, um, if anyone's read about that, that where, um, where Reagan actually, uh, the, where the legislation actually uh, legalized about 2.7 million people. Um, you had to qualify, you would have been in the US for a certain number of years and not be a criminal and stuff like that. But, um, and also cracked down on enforcing the border. Um, under Bill Clinton, um, there was a sort of, in the 1990s, there was a, um, 
a lot of anti-immigrant, not anti-immigrant, concern about immigrate. Sometimes it was anti-immigrant, but concern about anti about immigration. Um, and um, he he um, directed um, or authorized operations like Operation Gatekeeper, Operation Hold the Line, all policies that really focused on expanding the power of the Border Patrol, um, building walls and fencing, um, which, uh, which if, you, if you haven't seen this, this is the 700 miles of wall and fencing that's been built since 2006. But the, the, the point is that wall, we've been building walls of, along the border for quite a long time. So it's not actually a new idea. It's not a post-2016 idea for sure. Um, there's more I could talk about with regard to law, but maybe I'll, I'll save that for if we have Q&A about it. So, um, so anyway, and then this is just to remind us how, how um, dangerous it's gotten to, to cross the border. And as we see these laws that have made it more difficult to cross the border, we've also seen a spike in deaths along the border. So, so um, that's both influenced people's decisions to stay in the United States once they get here, but it also hasn't deterred people from trying to come to the United States. Um, so just to go back to this slide, you know, now we have um, 36 million people of Mexican origin. Mexican origin people make up 11% of the population of the United States. Um, more than half of Mexican immigrants in the U.S. are undocumented, um, but they're also the largest number of legal immigrants here. So this migration has been really important to our history, and it is um, important to understand uh, how far back in history it goes. And I just wanted to add, the number, I alluded to this before, but um, the number of, you can't read this, the number of um, undocumented Mexican immigrants is, actually the number of Mexican immigrants overall is actually currently declining. So since 2006, um, we've seen a uh, um, decline in the number of people coming from Mexico. We've seen um, people returning to Mexico from the United States, and that has to do with um, actually the Mexican economy and things getting better in Mexico, people having more opportunities in Mexico, and then it also has to do with the conclusion of that demographic transition, where Mexico's um, birth rate is now actually below uh, replacement level. It's, I think, 2.07 um, children per woman. So um, that's, the, that's the end of that demographic revolution. And, you know, 10 years ago when I was in grad school, or 15 years ago <laughs> when I was in grad school, I heard a presentation by a, an expert on Mexican history who said, um, who predicted that this would happen, who said, you know, just look at the demographics and look at how um, the, the youth bubble is getting older and they're not having as many children and those children are not going to need to migrate to the United States. And, that ha and, I, and I sort of thought, how can this migration end? It's been going on for so long. And it's not that it's ending, but, um, but it's certainly changing. And th there was a fascinating article um, a little while ago by a reporter named Alfredo Cochado, who's written great books about immigration, who interviewed a bunch of people in central Mexico in the traditional sending re regions, and they said, we don't, we don't see the need to come here anymore. That said, there are still factors that are pushing people out of Mexico, especially in the narco-trafficking areas, the areas where the violence has been um, worst, um, and in the poorer states in the south. So uh, it's not that Mexican migration is over, but there are some pretty significant changes. Okay. So now let's turn to Cuban migration history, which has a different, which has a different sort of historical trajectory. Um, let me see how I'm doing for time. Okay. Um, so in some ways, it's common for us to think of Cuban migration as more political than economic, um, because so much of it has to do with the Cuban Revolution um, of 1959. But uh, but actually, economics are really important here too, and current. Cuban immigration is largely driven by the economic situation that the political re revolution has brought about. Um, so it's hard to separate out. The, I mean, this is why I sort of have a problem with the way we classify migrants as, you know, are they refugees or are they labor migrants? Well, the causes are often really interlinked. And so that's a sort of, um, it's not always a really helpful way of talking about immigrants. Um, okay, so Cubans are currently the seventh largest immigrant group in the U.S., um, in, the, in 2013, there were more than 1.1 million Cuban immigrants, and they're 2.8 percent of the total U.S. population. So much smaller than um, the Mexican population we were talking about. But um, they have had, as I said, an outsized impact on um, U.S. politics. We'll talk about that. Um, also, 
bear migration has a fairly long history in the US. Um, the, obviously, the vast majority of Cuban migrants come after 1959, but um, people were coming to the US in the 19th century. I don't have, a, I forgot to put a map of Cuba here. You all know where Cuba is, 90 miles from Miami, right? It's so, um, I, I forget which point of Cuba is 90 miles, but it's, it's very, very close. And um, Cuba has always had a sort of special relationship with the United States. Um, I don't know if you can see this. <laughs> this is a 19th century political cartoon uh, with Uncle Sam looking covetously at an apple that says Cuba. And the other apples in his basket are uh, Alaska, California, um, I can't, uh, Louisiana. So it's, the, so it's this idea that, that was very, um, very openly discussed in the 19th century in the US that Cuba should belong to the United States. It's so close. It's such a lovely island. Um, and then <laughs> that we should, we should annex it, right? So the US was um, very involved and very interested in Cuban politics. And then obviously, um, since presumably you guys probably did study this in, in your US history class, right? The Spanish-American War. Um, we, as Cuba is involved in its really decades long war for independence from Spain. Cuba is La Isla Fiel, the, the last Spanish, Cuba and Puerto Rico are the last Spanish colonies that are left um, in the Americas. And as Cuba goes, uh, fights for its independence, just as Cubans tell it, just at the moment they were about to achieve independence from Spain, the US swoops in and, um, and uh, essentially negotiates Cuban independence inserts itself, inserts a clause into the new Cuban constitution, constitution um, specifying that Cuba would be a protectorate of the United States and, and the US um, is very, very involved in Cuban politics for uh, the first 30 years of its independence. Um, so there's this close political relationship between Cuba and the US and so people are coming um, to the United States uh, this is a picture of Cuban cigar workers in Tampa in the late 19th or early 20th centuries. So it's, it's once again with the transportation revolution, once, once the steamships make it possible and easy for people to come from Cuba to the US, they do that. And actually um, the largest groups of immigrants in the early 19th century are not so much in Miami, but in um, near Tampa because of the cigar industry there, New Orleans um, and New York. Um, and, ma and many of those who were going to New York were going to work in factories. So there's that industrial revolution again. Um, Miami only starts to become important mm, after it gets air conditioning. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, by like 1920s, 1930s, Miami starts to emerge as a, as a vacation destination for Americans. And that link between Miami and Havana becomes more and more important. There's regular ferry service, there's air service that started in the 1920s. Miami becomes um, the staging area for the close relationship between Cuba and Florida. And increasingly, there's lots of political turbulence in Cuba. So increasingly, um, Cuban political refugees went there in the 1940s. Um, and even Castro actually, before he succeeds in the revolution, goes there to seek support from the small Cuban exile community in Miami. But obviously the massive migration starts um, oh, sorry, that's Jose Marti, who was also in exile in the United States. Um, the massive migration starts with the revolution of um, Fidel Castro and his uh, revolutionary movement um, in the late 1950s. It succeeds in 1959. Um, and uh, really almost right away um, after 1959, there's a pretty significant migration of um, sort of the, it tended to be the sort of wealthiest people who had the most access, the, the easiest ability to leave. Um, but uh, until basically from 1959 until the Cuban, Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, about 200,000 people leave Cuba. And that's really that first wave of migrants. Um, they're immediately granted refugee status because of the politics of the Cold War. Um, the US wants to support the people who are leaving Cuba and wants to support any movement um, to uh, overthrow the, within a few years of Castro coming to power to overthrow Castro. Um, that's a, we could also talk about that more, but. Um, uh, with the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, oh, there's one other thing I wanna talk about. Um, so there's this initial wave of people, and then um, very early on, 60, 1960, 1962, um, 
people start sending their children out of Cuba. The Cuban government cracks down on who can leave Cuba, but allows people to send their minor children out. And so there's actually a really interesting migration of 14,000 Cuban children. Um, it's, called, it's known as Operation Pedro Pan, who, which is Peter Pan. Um, and it's run actually by the Catholic Welfare Bureau of Miami. Um, the kids are placed in foster homes, in camps, um, and in sometimes in um, like Catholic orphanages or uh, convents. And, um, and just, and, and the, the idea was that the kids would go first and the parents would follow them a few months later. But the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 ends contact between the two countries and ends all commercial flights. And um, so there's a freeze on Cuban immigration. And so a lot of those kids actually end up being um, stuck in the US, sort of alone without their families. And they're still alive, most of them. I've talked to a lot, to, I've, I've heard presentations by them and talked to them. And it's a very traumatic story. And also a story that really resonates with our, especially you know, over the last year or so, as we've talked about unaccompanied minors coming to the United States. And some of those um, Pedro Pan, they call themselves the Pedro Pans. Some of the Pedro Pans have actually spoken out about you know, the experiences they have and how they relate to the children that are coming up now. Um, immigration picks up again when the Cuban government opens a port and allows people, some people, to go to the US, um, allows some Cubans to come to the US and pick people up by, via boat lift. And then there's an airlift in December 1965. These are known as the Freedom Flights. Oh, sorry. Okay, there we go. These are known as the Freedom Flights. Um, and another 300,000 Cubans arrived this way between 1965 and 1973. So we just see these sort of waves of migration that get interrupted by political events um, over the 1960s. Um, and uh, in the middle of the 1960s, we established the Cuban Adjustment Act. So the, here is the role of, again, the sort of role of government in setting, in shaping immigration. Um, and it's really, it's part of our Cold War politics. So we codify a fast track path to permanent residency for Cuban exiles. Um, they can, after they are here for one year, they can apply for permanent residence and then for a green card. Um, and along with the policy comes a sort of unofficial policy that very few Cubans are repatriated if they land on US soil. So we allow them to come here and then we make it easy for them to um, legalize themselves. Um, they're granted a variety of visa waivers. They're offered a variety of services to help them on their arrival. Um, there's a college loan program. There's a bilingual education program. And these are programs, these are sort of government programs. There's a US Cuban refugee program that helps, sort of designed to help them adjust to their lives in the US. So Cubans really got, uh, you know, enjoyed a sort of privileged position vis-a-vis -vis other Latin American immigrants, um, especially Mexicans. And so Latin American immigrants in the US are very aware of, the, of those differences and those historical differences. Um, I didn't mention Puerto Ricans. I sh just should, should mention them very quickly because obviously they're part of that history of the Spanish-American War, right? This is the same time that the US annexes Puerto Rico. And in 19, I think it was 1921, um, Puerto Ricans become US citizens. So when we talk about Puerto Ricans, they're, you know this, I'm sure, but they're not immigrants. They're just, they're migrants because they're US citizens. They're able to travel between Puerto Rico and the US. Um, okay, uh, a, just a little bit, a little more from the airlift, um, a little bit more about more recent Cuban migration. So um, this, this sort of second bit, the, if the first wave of migration that I talked about is the immediate exiles of the revolution, who tended to be, like I said, a little wealthier, a little whiter, um, a little more educated, um, which is not to say they didn't have a hard time in the US, they did. But the next wave, the post-1980 wave, really, and since 1980, has been um, often people that um, were a little poorer, um, people that, were, uh, that maybe didn't have as many connections in the United States. Um, in April 1980, the Cuban government opened the port of Mariel um, in, outside of Havana to anyone who wanted to leave. Um, and the Cuban exile community sent boats to the port and returned with thousands of refugees. So that's one of the boats from the Mariel boat lift. Um, they were also able to um, acquire refugee status and to become legalized for the most part. But there's a kind of new um, tension because the Cuban government, government famously um, released prisoners and what 
people that they labeled mentally ill, um, and they were included in that migration. So there's a kind of a stigma with being a Marialito um, that's, or that's sometimes associated with being a Marialito, even though a lot of the people who came were, um, were just migrants, were regular migrants who were looking for um, a way out of Cuba. Um, okay, and then more recently since the 1990s, I mean, as I showed you in that um, earlier chart, immigration has continued to rise. So after the 1990s, we have, well, what happens in 1989, 1990 that might have affected the economy of Cuba? Yeah, the collapse of the Soviet Union. So the Cuban, Cuban economy, or Cuban government names this period the special period in a time of peace, and it's, um, <laughs> And this is, the, uh, this is the time when the Cuban economy just completely collapses and people don't have enough to eat. I, w I went to Cuba when I was in college actually and I remember someone, I asked them what the special period was like and they said, um, we only ate soy and I'll never eat soy again. So that was my, that's my anecdote from <laughs> what I, what, you know, but, um, but there, were, there were food shortages. Um, people weren't necessarily starving, but close to that. Um, and uh, so that began a, um, that sort of pushed out a new wave of Cubans. And, um, and this is when, this, the, this is the wave that's often referred to as the balseros, the rafters, the people who built these rafts. And uh, this is, uh, I, took this pic I took that picture and then this picture, which has my son for scale. Um, he's bigger now, but, uh, <laughs> but um, this is a tiny, tiny boat. And these were boats that, this is basically anyone who could build some kind of seaworthy craft um, and could use that to escape Cuba did so. Um, and, uh, and, this, and this was in the news a lot in the 90s, for those of you who remember the news in the 90s. Um, I will try to mention Elian Gonzalez um, at the end of this talk, actually. Um, the 90s was also the time when we had an agreement between the US, or when we established an agreement um, that's known as the wet foot, dry foot policy. Um, where Cubans who were apprehended at sea, and this is really about a, a, a kind, of, kind of pushback at the balseros, right? We didn't, the US media like sort of portrays these images of Cubans and rafts coming to the US and almost like an invasion, right? We didn't, that, that, did, that wasn't super popular. <laughs> and so the wet foot dry, policy, dry foot policy said that if you apprehended at sea, you could be returned back to Cuba. And if you, were, if you made it to land, then you would have a chance to apply for, apply for um, legal, legal status after you were here for a year. Um, so, uh, and, and since the 90s, um, immigrant, uh, Cuban immigrants have continued to come. We're in the middle of another, or we're, we're, yeah, we're in the middle of another spike of Cuban immigration. Um, but the wet foot, dry foot policy was repealed by Barack Obama at the end of his term. Um, and uh, Cubans are now subject to deportation if they are detained at the border without a visa. And um, the number of Cubans, uh, okay, oh, so, so here's a, here we can see the number of Cubans entering on the rise in the late, in the teens. And then um, the number of deported Cubans is on the rise. And this is still like minuscule compared to the number of people who are being deported who are from other countries, but it's really significant in the history of Cuban migration because Cubans have always been these sort of exceptional migrants. Um, and they're also now subject to the new remain in Mexico policy where they're being required to, um, if they make it up to the border, they're being required to wait in Mexico to apply for asylum status, along with 40,000 other people. So, um, so we've seen a lot of changes in Cuban policy and we've also seen the ways that US-Cuban relations have really shaped that policy. Um, okay, Central American migration, the last migration that I will talk about. Um, Okay, so you've probably heard a lot about the Northern Triangle. We've suddenly, I mean, it, it's a term that I didn't hear a lot, um, and then suddenly it's become a term, and, and it's everywhere in the news. So it generally refers to Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, but Nicaragua should also, I think, be included because there are migrants from Nicaragua as well, and Nicaragua has suffered from some of the same um, political upheavals and push, and, and there are some of the same push factors there as well. So, um, but anyway, Central American migration is pretty new compared to Cuban and Mexican migration. Um, and really prior to the 1970s, there were only very tiny numbers of Central American migrants in the US. Um, it really, this immigration really takes off in the 80s and 90s, and of course it's important today. Um, 
if you're in the if you're from the DC area or you're living in the DC area, you might you you probably know more about Central American migration than a lot of other people in the country because the DC area is a huge magnet for Central American migrants. And since really the 80s and 90s, we've seen. Uh, we actually are unique in the U.S. in that we don't have a lot of Mexican migrants. We don't have a lot of Cuban migrants. There are, they're here, but the largest n numbers of migrants, Salvadorans are number one. Um, I think Guatemalans are number two, and then Bolivians, Peruvians. We have a, a more pan-Latin American migrant community here in D.C. Um, okay, so again, the, the push factors behind Central American migration have a pretty deep history. Um, Uh, let's see. Oh, here. Oh, this is a little bit about numbers, actually. And this, I wanted to, I wanted to show you. So this is Mexico. This is Mexican migration, and you can see how it has leveled off and declined. Um, and just as it's declined, um, migration from Central America has risen. So in some ways, that problem of undocumented immigration that hasn't that hasn't started to go away just because Mexicans aren't doing it as much. It's just been replaced by people coming from Central America and from other parts of the world that I'm not talking about today. Um, and then here again, more non-Mexicans than Mexicans apprehended in 16, and a lot of these non-Mexicans are Central Americans. Um, the, same, the, same, the same thing. So, um, okay, so in Central America, we have a history of extreme poverty, even as compared to the rest of Latin America, these countries in Central America have historically been um, fairly poor. And they've also had, and they're places that are really rich in culture and history and they're beautiful countries, but they're also places where historically, certainly in the 19th and 20th centuries, there have been large, landless, poor, um, rural populations, many of whom are indigenous, a lot of whom don't speak Spanish to this day. Um, uh, there tended to be a pattern in the politics of these countries of small oligarchical networks that held a lot of the land and the wealth and the power. Um, like in El Salvador, they were known as uh, uh, Las Catorce Familias, the 14 families, and it was sort of like these 14 families that power, like political power rotated through them and they owned a lot of the land um, in El Salvador. Um, their economies were, were generally export dependent. Um, most important, the most important products historically were coffee and bananas, and those are still really important to this day. Um, and those exports brought wealth, but the, that wealth tended to be um, unequally distributed. Um, there was also a history of, of uh, violence and political instability. Um, there is a tendency for uh, politi yeah, political reg regimes to vacillate between liberal and conservative policies um, and, and, and to devolve into civil war. Um, sometimes rural landless populations would rise up in revolt. So in the early 1920s, the followers of Agosto Sandino in Nicaragua are one example, and, and th that's actually who the, the more modern Sandinistas are named after. Um, but more often than not, these, these rebellions were put down in, in usually through violence um, and would result in authoritarian regimes. So um, by the mid 20th century, we start to see a lot of new popular political movements, some of which are influenced by um, Marxist movements across Latin America, um, others by the labor, labor movement or um, by the ideas of the Mexican Revolution. Um, and a lot of these movements aggressively and sometimes violently attempted to change and challenge these old hierarchies. Um, these hierarchies, the, the systems in place would often respond by allowing or inviting the military in to take power. And so these conflicts developed into really significant and enduring civil wars in Guatemala, which um, was at war for, um, for 36 years, from 1960 until 1996. Um, El Salvador, which was at war from 1980 to 1992. And Nicaragua, which had its war with the Contras from 1980 to 1990. And I don't want to judge, but some of you look like you might not be old enough to remember watching the Iran-Contra scandal on TV. It was kind of like one of the first, I mean, I, I was like one of the first, uh, I remember hearing about it on NPR in the 80s, right? But um, so, so, that leads, so that leads us to the role of the United States in some of these conflicts. Um, and, and I want to be clear, like the U.S. doesn't cause the conflicts that happen in, in, in Latin America. Like some of these conflicts are going to happen anyway, 
but um, we tend to not make them that much better. Um, so, uh, you know, the U.S. has already, by, you know, by the mid-19th century, and I've already talked about the ways that the U.S., you know, was interested in Cuba and the Caribbean, but um, in Central America as well, the U.S. becomes the, really the most important economic and political power. Um, it comes to see Central America especially as vital to national interests and business interests. And there are multiple invasions of Central America in the first part of the 20th century, so in the Caribbean. So we have the Spanish-American War that we've already talked about, um, the, the construction of the Panama Canal, which involves intervening in uh, the politics of Colombia and in helping to create Panama, um, invasions of Honduras and Nicaragua and Mexico and the Dominican, Dominican Republic, and on and on. You may have read about gunboat diplomacy, this idea of sort of like if you if you if we don't like your policy, we're going to park our gunboats right outside your um, your bay, and you can you can see what you think about what you want to do. Um, so, and then we also see the rise of these these American firms that are become very powerful in Central America that own land and property there. So, most importantly, is the United Fruit Company, um, which is now Chiquita Banana. And I always tell my students when I teach them modern Latin at the beginning of the semester on modern Latin America, I'm like, you're going to look at bananas differently by the end of the semester. Um, so, uh, so United Fruit becomes very important and influential in the politics of Central America. Um, and thanks to you know, weak states and pliable rulers, essentially the company is able to say, you know, we don't like this, we don't like this political movement. We don't like this potential policy of you know, redistributing, redistributing land you know, from, from our company to farmers, for example. And so, uh, so really through campaigns of pressure and also by um, invoking the specter of communism, um, United Fruit and the U.S. government is, uh, United Fruit helps induce the U.S. government to intervene in Central American politics. Um, and by the 40s and 50s and, into the, and really into the 90s, we see increasing involvement of the CIA and the State Department in internal, internal political developments in Central America and, of course, really throughout Latin America. Um, and, it's, and it's really, it's, it's a fairly, and the policy is, um, especially in the wake of the Cuban Revolution in, the 19, in 1959, keep another Cuba from happening. So if it looks, if, if someone looks communist, then we want, we in the U.S. want to make sure that their movement does not succeed. And so we want to make sure we fund whatever movement opposes them. Um, and uh, so we tended to support military dictatorships um, through aid and training and supplying them with arms. So there's the Iran-Contra scandal. Um, in El Salvador, that, and that was in, um, that was in uh, Nicaragua. In El Salvador, we gave billions to the government to fight the socialist um, Barabundo Magdi National Liberation Front, the FMLN. In Guatemala, the CIA collaborated with, with, with the United Fruit Company. There's a wonderful book on this called Bitter Fruit um, to support the overthrow of a democratically elected leader and replace him with a military ruler. And this, you know, again, this didn't cause the civil war, but it didn't help prevent the civil war. Um, and uh, so, so we can see how this sort of these, again, these foreign policies help lead to these domestic con conflicts in Central America that fueled immigration. So again, these civil wars are happening between the sort of mid 60s into the 90s and migration really um, picks up in the 70s and into the 80s from Central America. Um, it's also just worth mentioning here because it's interesting that, uh, and, and another sort of fact we don't tend to learn in our high school history classes that um, we established in 1946 the School of the Americas, and this is really part of our sort of Cold War approach um, to provide combat, a combat training school for Latin American soldiers in order to influence military and government leaders. And a lot of the people that we trained at the School of the Americas went on to play a very important role in Latin American politics, and unfortunately, they don't have the best human rights record. So um, the picture is Efrain Rios Montt, who is, um, was president of Guatemala during the Civil War and was convicted of genocide. He, ju he just died recently, and he is an alumnus of the School of the Americas. 
um, which still exists. It's now called the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation. So, um, look it up. So anyway, so we, okay, I'll come to this in a second. But so we see how, the, so these civil wars, this violence led to waves of migration. Um, just to focus quickly on Salvadorans, since we're in DC, um, throughout the 1980s, more than 500,000 Salvadorans migrated, most illegally. Um, because remember, they, there aren't a lot of avenues for legal migration for Latin Americans. Um, most of them come to Los Angeles and to DC. Um, US immigration authorities at the time turned away Salvadoran asylum seekers, and that was actually the birth of the, of the sanctuary movement, which we talk about today. The, the, um, a lot of US, over 400 US cities declared themselves sanctuaries. There was a religious movement um, to offer these migrants shelter, um, and it was connected to, there, there was, um, yeah, the, that movement was connected to sort of a protest about our policies in Central America and the violence that they had um, helped to foment. Um, eventually, many of uh, the Salvadorans in the US were able to get um, TPS, Temporary Protective Status. Um, most of them still have that today. Um, that is set to expire in January, I think. And the Trump administration does not want to um, reinstate it, and that would impact uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, in the in the country. I can't remember the exact number, but there was just a really good article on this in the time in the New York Times. Um, so we're going to have to see what happens to the Salvadorans in D.C., many of whom are living here now legally, but with this temporary protective status that can expire. Um, okay, final push factor for Central America is also something really important to consider, and some of you probably know this already, but um, do you guys know where MS-13 started? Yeah, so I, this, I think this fact has like filtered out finally. But um, gang violence is a huge push factor right now in migration from Central America. And um, MS-13, as you, as you guys know, was founded in poor neighborhoods in Los Angeles in the 1980s by some of the same migrants who were, who were coming here from those Civil War-torn countries. Um, and, it, and, that was, and it was in the context of the sort of gangs of Southeast LA, right? Um, there were Mexican gangs there, there were African-American gangs there, and so, um, I see I'm almost out of time, okay. And so, uh, in the mid-90s, under Clinton, as a part of, our, of, of Clinton's um, restrictionary sort of cracking down policies on migration, um, over 20,000 convicted gang members were returned to Central America, where the weak governments of Central America had very little ability to do anything um, to control their activity or to crack down on them. And so those gangs flourished in Central America. There's a huge increase in violence after the 90s. Um, a huge increase in the prison population, um, a huge rise in extortion, increasing links between MS-13 and narco trafficking. Um, and now MS-13, ironically, has come back to new places, not just Los Angeles, but come back to the United States. It's now embedded in immigrant communities in, um, also in DC, in New York. Um, and this is a really uh, obviously harmful thing for the broader community, but also for these immigrant communities especially, because they they're the ones who tend to be the victims of extortion and violence um, of these gang, gang members. So, okay, very quickly and in conclusion, <laughs> um, the impact of Latin American migration on the US. So, I would say that Latin American migration has revolutionized the United States by becoming an integral part of our economy through demographic change, through political upheaval over immigration, and through the ways that Latin American immigrants themselves relate to US politics. So our economy, we have an economy that's now dependent on immigrant labor, but also on undocumented immigrant labor. I've written a lot about this, so if you wanna Google stuff that I've written, I will, I will not talk about it too much now, except just to say that, um, you know, that our policies don't reflect the demands of our economy. In the, in the least. People know that if they can cross the border, they can get a job. And so there is um, a need for comprehensive immigration reform. Um, okay, also demographic change. Our, our the, the country is increasingly Latino. Um, there are now 40 million people of Latin American descent and Spanish is spoken widely throughout the country. Um, this is, I'm sorry, this is from 2000, but I didn't have an equivalent map, but you can see the 
sort of hot spots of, of Spanish speaking, and there's a little yellow bubble for the DC area. Um, and that has changed culture in certain locations, um, especially Miami, California, Texas, although you could argue that you know, the border didn't cross, you know, but California and Texas have gone back to their historical, uh, historical roles a little bit. Um, and uh, so that is, that, that, is the, that is a change and one that I think is wonderful. Um, but it also has represented a change and sometimes it has spurred, sorry, I'm gonna skip through this. Um, it has spurred uh, political upheaval over immigration in the US. So not, the, not for the first time, we've had many anti-immigrant and nativist and xenophobic movements in the US, but um, we are certainly in the middle of one now. Uh, 2016 doesn't represent the first time, but it has certainly seemed to kind of open the floodgates. Um, we are cracking down on um, immigrants in the US, there are deportation raids, there are detention centers across the country, and um, most, I think, significantly, well, significantly, the Trump administration is making it far more difficult for people to seek asylum and um, to, to, yeah, to even request asylum. Uh, and we're making it, we just, just last week we announced that we're reducing the cap on refugees to the unprecedented low of 18,000 people a year, and that's down from, I think, 100, 150 or 120,000 a few years ago. Um, so we, so that, ha that, it's not that immigration from Latin America has affected our policy, but, um, but certainly politicians have pointed a lot to immigration from Latin America as a reason to um, make new restrictionist policies. Um, okay, and then I think interestingly and finally, um, the Latino vote. There was a great article in the New Yorker from a couple weeks ago it was called uh, The Fight for the Latino Vote in Florida. Um, and it was about, um, it was mostly about Cubans and Venezuelans uh, who, are, who are here, who can vote, and who are motivated to vote for um, Trump and for Republicans because, um, because of their own experiences in Cuba and Venezuela with socialist governments um, that, that you know, really were, uh, are dictators and autocratic and they want that not to happen in the United States, and they read their own experience in Latin America directly into their experience in the United States. So, you know, it's just one of the ways that people's experiences in their homeland informs the ways that they view politics and experience politics in the US, and it's also a reminder not to consider the Latino, Latin American origin electorate as one, as one group, right? Because, you know, there's Mexicans in, Mexicans, people of Mexican origin have tended to vote for Democrats. Um, and they've had a, you know, a history of the Chicano movement, for example, a history of sort of being involved in politics more of on the labor side or on the left. Um, but that's certainly not true of all Latin American immigrants in the US. So um, I didn't talk about Elian Gonzalez, but I'll conclude, with, I'll conclude with that. And we can, if we have a minute or two, we can have questions or people can chat with me afterwards. But thank you very much.